what is up you guys, as always, welcome back to, well, more of a talkative video about Game Freak and their CEDEC, which I really don't know what it stands for, but basically this is a more of a company interview um, with Game Freak and I'm pretty sure it has more to do with a dialogue to their shareholders, but for us fans it works too, as um, it helps us get some transparency of what went down with these games and their thought process. Um, as a fan of Pokemon, this is of course very interesting to read about, I'm gonna link that down below, but more so as a more of a marketing planner, I really like the idea of getting Eastern companies getting more transparent and talk about what went down to their production. The reason I say this is because Western companies in general are always transparent in to a, to a fault of course, but not about the product, but what they're doing and how far they got, and while Eastern companies tend to avoid as much as possible, they don't want to be as transparent as they want to have a competitive edge, and um, it works for them. I should definitely state that. While it could look, well, weird for us, at the same time, it's great when it takes their time after a few years to go down what went down in their company. And for Game Freak, I think that's extremely important. And what I found interesting with this one is they went over the production production processes and maybe why Sword and Shield turned out the way it did. Not by the limited decks, I think, while it bothers me on a fundamental level, it really does. Uh, they also talk about the use over 1000 models for Legends of Osteos, which is a Pokedex of, what is that, like 300 months, stuff like that. Which means, well, however we want to turn it, that there is a significant amount of work that goes down to making these models. And while it sucks for us that um, that comes as a price, I can also see why they started to make a limited decks because maybe the production just became too big to keep afloat. That also means that we're not going to see in a modern console game uh, a full decks as far as we are aware. That said, there are a few things I think are very interesting with this one, and it is that production of Sword and Shield um, was started way before Switch came out, which of course makes sense. 2017, um, they started 2016 as the most likely the kits for Switch were coming. But another aspect that's interesting is that both Legends of Arceus and Scarlet and Violet was starting production 2018, a full year before Sword and Shield. I think that's quite significant. While I think the finishing touches are made with Sword and Shield, um, I thought we're doing that like late to spring of 2019, but no, they were done with that at fall. So whatever they were presenting, the game was already done. Like the DLC, everything was planned out. And that also means that they were probably, um, most likely, even with the shitstorm behind them, they were done with that game. It was it was only marketing from that point on and keeping the game afloat and the game turned out to sell well almost as good as or it's the most sold modern Pokemon games in Generation 3. I think that's quite significant. While you could argue that the Switch have sold a lot more, which means that the game are much more compelling and or easier to obtain, I guess, it, it still is significant because it's it means the game did good. But what I think is interesting is that Sword and Shield might not have had that heavy planning behind it, as once the game was done, one year in, or one year after Switch was out, it means that whatever graphical leaps were done before that time, the game were going to look dated, and it did. And consider most of these games are three year planning, I really can't help but feel what if it actually was planned for Wii U from the beginning, but they copped out, or they had to, because they were switching consoles. I mean, they must have had that dialogue in the company already, but I can't help feeling that what if, considered the short time span really they had with Sword and Shield in contrast to the console and what could have been done, it also makes sense that the latest Vasius looked vastly different because it is made with knowledge of the console. Um, even though the game isn't like Apex great, it still is a significant graphical leap between the games. And same thing probably with Scarlet and Violet as these full three years as a console is active means that you know more the ins and outs of what to do with the engine. And so I think you're gonna see a, a vast difference between these games. It also, of course, like I said, speaks more of all into what Sword Shield might at times look just not as polished as let's say other Nintendo titles. 
Because um, I think the reason Scarlet and Javala will be great is because of their graphical leap ahead. Um, Sword and Shield kind of got that... Well, they got a perfect storm on their hand, really, when it comes to you know, limited decks and graphical leaps that looked years behind what was already released through Nintendo with Mario Odyssey, Breath of the Wild, Zelda. I know you can't make those comparisons, but at the same time, you gotta acknowledge that if they put the benchmarks and you go into as a AAA title, it looks something similarly, and I don't believe when you get that, that we get something very, very strange. Um, one thing to be able to break is that Legend of Arceus and Scarlet and Violet are, were pretty much built the same time. Most likely the teams were working with one another to make sure that whatever were working in Legend of Arceus, they were going to implement it in the next game. Most likely the free Roman aspect. Can it be done? If so, how? And um, I like that. I think that's great because as Water Shield, you get a feeling of what they wanted to create with Lens Vasius, but get the time to create it, to implement it later, most likely in Scarlet and Violet. And I just think that's important because it means that even though they're different titles, they were probably working together. It also means that Brilliant Down and Shining Pearl were never like, they probably just say, hey, remake, make it to that mobile company that made it, which I, for the life of me can't remember the name right now. I cannot miss the essence of actually Googling the name and forget, fuck it. Um, so most likely they had no intention of making Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl you know, as big of a game as any other remakes before them, which sucks for us fans, but at the same time, for them, it was treated like just a game. Lady of Asius were their true remake that we, I shouldn't say missed out on, but they, they, they gambled it. Either they make Legends of Arceus the real Brilliant Diamond Shine Pro remake, but they wanted to do something more, but they couldn't do it in a way that would probably stimulate the fans in a way they wanted to, you know, ching ching, make the money, right? I can only speculate on that one, but I think it makes sense in their timeline. They probably just, they wanted another game to be out, and the game itself had already, like, this is how the game should play about. Um, Besides that, they were talking about modeling and how they're using, and of course, that they reuse models of pre existing models. Uh, for example, Lucario has two heads, or two hands, <laughs> two heads, two hands, and two legs, and, and one head. And of course, that means that all humanoid can probably mold it from that very model. So, a lot of base model work with the wire work, and I think those looks cool, and I think it makes sense to reuse the models as you just put in layers and textures on them anyway and you can mold them in such a way that you save a lot of time. I mean, these models take a few times to actually, well, fix. And one other thing that they actually took while I was making Land of Asius was rotating models, how they were moving about. I Look, it looks very archaean when the models, you know, turn like this, <laughs> like flat surface is surfing around a 3D board. Uh, so they made animation for them leaning and turning and um, I mean I like that they actually took the time they were talking about that this was an aftermath that they didn't consider because they were just wild roaming Pokemon they had idea that well as long as um, the Pokemon is there that's the quest but of course how to move about on the field might actually enhance the experience of them being somewhat alive so every Pokemon that was implemented got a new model for just turn. And like I said, you don't consider these things like that's a big issue, but consider if you have to make like 600 plus Pokemon uh, be able to turn. Like all of a sudden, hey, we gotta reuse these, but we go going to remake them and make sure that these looks convincing. So I just, like I said, I think it's cool. I think the words down to there, they're actually taking the feedback while it doesn't all right, we're gonna fix this in the next update. They were basically like, for the next thing, probably to fix this. Like, people are clearly calling this out that it looks, it, it ages the game a lot more. So, with that said, like, that would come down to basically what the whole was, was about. The presentation, how long they plan a game, and how they work together to make that work. And like I said, the interesting part about this, I think, is that how short of a time span Game Freak gave Sword and Shield for a more modern polish I think the reason Sword and Shield gets a, such a sour taste in the fan base is because for a console game, you have a lot more higher standards in contrast to a 3DS game. A 3DS game, they look quite right and convincing at the end, but when the graphical leaps are so little behind them, it looks like the console game is made for handheld. Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl kind of 
came in that category too. I get that there are like, how do you say, um, faster way of making these games and cheats. I, I shouldn't say that. What, what's, what do you call it? Um, pathways to make it faster. It's another word for it. I can't remember the name. I'm sorry. But when it shows, it is because the standards of the game. Like if you make a console game, it's going, it has to look like a console game. When it look like the handheld games, people are going to call that out. And while not everybody found that as an issue, the few that did were quite loud, me included. Um, so I think it's important that they actually showcase that Sword of Shield did not like, get one time of Switch production. That's it. Then it had to come out. That, that was a time crunch they were on. And um, well, they would never probably couldn't say it that they probably didn't finish or polish it the way they wanted to as a game is in contrast never finished. It helps to see that they, they probably couldn't have. I mean, there's a reason, like I said, Legends of Ours, it looks so much better. And I think it's important to remember why it looked better. And it's because it's time on console active. So that's it, guys. So hope you enjoyed this short video of the CEDEC. Jesus, what does that even stand for? A company entertainment hangout. I don't know. That's it. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you next video. Till then, take care, everyone.